if you're here and that's a struggle for you, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Conversations are a great way of building bridges, right? Where we can talk face to face and talk through the issues and help come to an understanding of what God's word teaches. So I want you to know that today. Hey, would you pray with me today? We're gonna take a moment. We're just gonna pause. We're gonna pray for our nation. I'm gonna ask you where you're seated today. Would you just cry out for our country? Father, we love you today. God, we're thankful that ultimately that we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we are citizens in a kingdom that cannot be defeated. God, we pray that, Lord, as we go to the ballot boxes and as we vote, we would do so understanding that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven first. God, that that citizenship would inform the decisions we make on Tuesday. Lord, I pray for your people, God, for those today that are even in this room or watching online that feel torn and it's a difficult season for them. God, I pray that, Lord, your peace would step in. God, I pray that your word would be illuminated to them. Lord God, that we would always be a church that speaks up for life. God, that we would value life and we would understand that the enemy always wants to counterfeit. God, I pray that, Lord, today we would see past the lies and understand that any attack on human life is ultimately attack on the attack on the creator of life. So Lord, today, give us wisdom. God, I pray for your people. God, give us courage and give us strength. Lord, we love you today and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're continuing a series we started last week and Pastor Quentin kicked it off, a series entitled Overcomer. And we want to encourage you and challenge you to live lives as overcomers. Over these next few weeks, we're going to be challenged with a number of thoughts that will impact the way we live our lives. We want you to embrace the identity of an overcomer. How many guys understand we overcome because Jesus is an overcomer? Amen. And we want you to live that kind of life. We're going to speak to areas in your life where you need to embrace the person of Christ to overcome difficulties of your past. We also want to teach you to build resiliency and grit and to develop a healthy internal world. How many guys know that the words grit and resiliency aren't words we talk a lot about in culture anymore? In fact, we're often encouraged just to, if things happen, that it's someone else's fault or that that we don't have to take responsibility. And yet when we look at God's word, one of the things that happens is, is when the internal man is built and becomes more like Christ, there develops in us this victorious nature. One of the things the enemy wants for you today is he wants you to have a victim mentality. And I want you to hear me that he is victorious and he's an overcomer. We want you to find community, which is crucial to living out the life of Christ. So as we unpack this over the next few weeks, we're gonna encourage you to kind of go along on a journey with us. We're gonna be talking about a lot of different topics. And today I get the opportunity to kind of walk into some very specific areas I wanna talk to you about, about living in this world. If I were to ask you today what your greatest fear is, what would you say it is? Somebody shout something at me. Tornadoes. All right, there we go. How many of you guys are afraid of the dark? Okay, heights. Early in my marriage to my wife, I found out she was afraid of mice when I found her screaming, standing on the top of a counter in her kitchen. I have never teased her about mice since then. I found it interesting, they listed the top 10 fears in America, things like you would expect, like heights and public speaking and certain kinds of animals and drowning and claustrophobia, strangers and flying. I thought it was interesting that zombies also made the list, (laughs) along with clowns. There's a a lot of things in this life that can produce fear. They can cause us to be anxious or to worry. Why? Because this life has plenty of troubles, doesn't it? In fact, John chapter 16, verse 33 says this, I have said these things to you that in me you may have what? Peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have what? Overcome the world. He's an overcomer. 
This is our jumping off point for this entire series that we serve a God that says, even in the midst of tribulation, difficulty and and middle sickness, things are happening around you, that when that happens, take heart because he has overcome the world. For you and I today, that should be of great comfort. But I understand that there are those of you in the room today that wrestle. Often when I have conversations with people, this question comes up a lot. Does God love me? Does God love me? Often I find it's based out of a place where we have a difficult time loving and forgiving ourselves. But people ask that question in a very genuine way. Does God love me? Does God love me in spite of my past? If we took time today and we were able to hear all of our stories in this room, we would be troubled, it would be difficult. How about this, does God love me even when I struggle with repeated and secret sin? What do I do if things aren't going the way I expected them to go? Here's one that all the parents will sympathize with in the room. Man, when you're raising kids, there's some worry and fear the enemy loves to seed in us about their futures and what they're gonna do and the decisions they're gonna make. Does God love that person more because their kids are good and love me less because my kids are struggling? That's not something we like to say publicly, and yet I've had people in private moments express that fear. We say, why talk about that? Because we have to understand something today, that all of those circumstantial things, what do you say, in this world you'll have trouble, can create in us fear, anxiety, and worry. What we do, our circumstances, what happens when life doesn't turn out the way we thought it was going to turn out? One of my greatest concerns and ours as a staff for you as believers is that you would allow your circumstances and culture to dictate how you read scripture and understand his character. There's no doubt that there's a lot to unpack. And if you're new to faith, that uh, it can often be difficult to read through scripture and understand it. There are difficult moments as you wade through the Old Testament and you read about God and what he did and things that happened. Maybe you read some promises and say, well, boy, I haven't seen that yet. Our desire is that you would learn to overcome your past and any unhealthy patterns, that you would begin to develop in you grit that would overcome and defeat a victim mentality and truly live a life as an overcomer. This morning, I wanna look at Hebrews chapter 12. There's a lot of things we could talk specifically about today, but there were kind of three things I really sense like the Holy Spirit highlighted to me to talk to us about being citizens of the kingdom. And you're gonna see what I'm talking about here in just a moment from Hebrews chapter 12. Let's read this together, Hebrews 12, 26 to 29. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. And this is out of Haggai chapter two, he says this, once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. The writer of Hebrews, hearkening back to Mount Sinai and Moses and the people of God and the mountain shaking. And he says, once again, there will be a shaking, prophetically speaking, speaking through Haggai. Verse 27 goes on to say, this means that all of creation will be shaken and removed. So that what? So the only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For God is what? Is a devouring fire. Another translation says it this way, everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that those things that can't be shaken will remain. Can I encourage you, man? If you wanna live as a citizen of the kingdom, you wanna be a citizen of the unshakable kingdom. I don't know about you, but to me, that reads like a prophetic picture of where we are today. Hear me, church, we are in a time of shaking. And it's meant to be that way. Why? So that you and I would cling on to those things that are unshakable. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear that there are things that cannot be shaken. And we must live our lives on those unshakable truths. So how do we do that? How do we embrace the unshakable kingdom while we live in a world that is being shaken. Let me give you just a couple of thoughts this morning. First thought is this, 
Your identity is not what has happened to you, but what is happening, excuse me, what has ha- not what has happened to you, but what is happening in you. Your identity is not what has happened to you, but what is happening in you. One of the things we face when we first come to Christ and often battle throughout a lifetime with Christ is, yeah, but what about my past? Hear me, church, we must submit our past to him. He is an overcomer. There is nothing you've done. There's nothing that he cannot overcome. It's one of the great first hurdles we as believers must begin to submit as a moment of faith that we understand that he has truly overcome the world. Romans chapter eight says it this way, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It's interesting that writing here, Paul says, who shall separate us? And then he goes on to list a whole list of what's, right? You just to note that for a moment, we'll come back to that. I think it's important. As it is written, and he quotes Psalm 44, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are not considered, we are, excuse me, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in, amen, right? It's interesting that when we read this text, I mentioned it, he says who, and then he gives us this full list of what's. I think Paul does this in a very, for a very specific reason. You see, I believe what he's highlighting to us is there are two who's when it comes to this idea of what can separate us, of the who that can separate us. When we feel like things are coming at us, how many of you guys know that when persecution, famine, and sword, it doesn't feel inanimate anymore, does it? And we understand the reason for that is that our enemy, the devil, right? He's always pushing at us. When these things come at us, it's important that we battle the who, not just the what. Paul wants to set up a contrast with the greater who. No matter who you have against you, you've got a who with you that's on your team. Hear me, church. He that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. He's already conquered. Jesus is stronger. It's not just enough to defeat defeat those things that he's made us more than conquerors. He has literally put us in a place, as one theologian said, to subjugate that thing fully to Christ and his rule. Some of you didn't get that this morning. We are more than conquerors. Again, not just to defeat it, but to fully make it a subject of Christ, to bring it under his authority, to bring it to the side so that we don't have to battle it anymore. God not only delivers us from our suffering and our pain, but he gives it purpose. Second Corinthians tells us that for our light and momentary troubles are achieving an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We understand what? That in this world, you're gonna have trouble. The writer of Hebrews says that this world will be shaken. That Satan, the one who attacks the identity of God in us, wants to shake everything. But the who of your salvation is greater than the who of your opposition. God transforms the opposition into a servant for his purpose, if you'll allow him. It's interesting when the Bible quotes somewhere else in scripture, there's often a point that's being made. You ever heard something like a quote or something and it reminds you of a line of a song and suddenly all day long you're singing that whole song? Don't you hate that, right? And half the time it's a song you're like, man, I thought I put that thing away a long time ago. But all day, that song is running through your mind. When Paul said this in Hebrews, excuse me, in Romans, when Paul makes this comment in Romans chapter eight, and he quotes the Psalm, all of his hearers, hear me, all of his hearers would immediately knew he was talking about Psalm 44. They would have known it was a Psalm about one of the darkest moments in Israel's past. 
They would have understood and been brought back to that passage when people, when people of God felt forsaken and in their sin that God had crushed them and that God wasn't on their side. And it was in that context that Paul said, listen, I want to give you what God is telling you about that moment of crushing, that thing that seems difficult. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. In that moment, he went back and he exegeted the text for them to help them understand the purpose of Psalm 44. I want you to hear me today. If you live in darkness, you're desperate or you're hopeless, Psalm 44 is speaking to you today. And Paul would point this out to you. The Psalm 44 is swallowed up by Romans chapter eight. He says this, do you feel like a sheep set to be slaughtered? Paul calls you more than a conqueror. He says, if you feel darkness is your only friend, then Paul says that not even death itself can harm you. It's important for us today to take hold of what God's word says about us. God's purposes are unchangeable. We serve a powerful God today. And all those things that oppose us, the famine, the sword, the earthly, the demonic powers are subjugated to an almighty God. Secondly, this morning, another way we embrace the unshakable kingdom while we live on this earth is to understand that you are not alone. I felt like God just over and over this week as I was praying, he just wanted you to hear you're not alone. You're not alone. Work on your identity. If you want to overcome this world, you want to live as an overcomer. Even when life gets difficult, you have to know your identity. And hear me, you have to know you're not alone. Loneliness strikes a nerve at humankind. In fact, when we look back to the garden. The very first thing that was mentioned that wasn't good was what? The man was alone. Up to that point, everything was good. Everything was good. But God looked at the loneliness of man and he made a helper for him. It's interesting that the enemy makes a counterfeit for every good thing that God gave us. And every one of his counterfeits actually make us more lonely than they bring fulfillment. That's why the unshakable kingdom is so important. Hebrews chapter six, verses 19 through 20. Hear me church, you're never alone. There's somebody that you need to hear that. You're never alone. Hebrews chapter six says this. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. I love that picture. Jesus going in, entering in to God, sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. In fact, historians tell us, mentions it what he's an anchor for the soul. Historians tell us that early Christians often had anchors put on their grave, not crosses. In fact, the cross was a symbol of, symbol of suffering and shame. It wasn't till later that the cross would become a symbol, but early Christians often put an anchor on their grave because they understood something that Jesus would become an anchor for the soul. This word here, forerunner, is a Greek word, prodromos. It's an interesting word because it describes a metaphor of a ship who brings an anchor into the harbor that was difficult to navigate. Often large ships would pull up to the edge of a port and stop until the forerunner would come and they would take the anchor for the larger ship and they would go into the harbor because they could navigate it more easily and they would drop the anchor in a safe place. And then that, that anchor rope would be taut to the ship and it would dr bring that guide, that larger ship safely into the harbor. Hear me today, Jesus is your forerunner. But hear me. There is no such thing. How many of you guys have ever seen a wireless anchor? There might be a lot of wireless things. There's no such thing as a wireless anchor. That's why the Holy Spirit's important. Why did he look at the disciples and say, you need to go to Jerusalem and wait for the comforter to be sent? Because he understood that we need something to tether us to the anchor. Jesus is the anchor. But listen, we need to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to understand you're not alone, you need that constant presence of the Holy Spirit walking alongside you. Today, you're as close to him as you desire to be. Anytime you get in that quiet place, you can pull hard on that anchor. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the guide, to pull you through difficult times. 
If Jesus is there making intercession for you and he's the anchor you're attached to, he'll bring you through. It's important today we understand that spiritual connection causes us to hold firmly to an unshakable kingdom. Can I encourage you today? Keep your anchor on a short leash. Stay close to the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. Proverbs 10 says this, when the storm is swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. This world will experience shaking. You may have just come through a season of shaking or you're about to enter a season of shaking. Here's what I know. You need to prepare for the storm you're not in. Often we wait to prepare until we're in the storm. I don't know who said this quote. I love it though. It says this, the same water that softens a potato hardens an egg. We need some more potatoes in the room. You can tweet that if you want to. I've seen it time and time again, the same people face similar difficulties. One person walks out hard and cold and bitter and the other person is softened because they experience the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit. What's the difference? It's whether or not we realize that in the middle of the storm, Jesus was there with us. When you remind ourselves of what Jesus has done, his sinless life, his death on the cross, the fact that he atoned for all of our sin. And lastly, this morning, if we're to embrace the unshakable kingdom, your mindset matters. Your mindset matters. I want you to understand your identity. I want you to know you're not alone. But very practically this week, I want you to do this. I want you to begin to work on your internal thoughts. Second Corinthians 10 says this, for we live, for though we live in a world, in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And what? And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Here's a practical thing I want you to do this week. I want you to begin to learn what it means to take your thoughts captive. Every time you have a thought that you know is unpleasing to the Lord, you gotta take it captive. That's why knowing scripture is so important, keeping that tight rope on the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, listen, it's a dangerous prayer, but you need to pray it. Lord, help me to process through my thought life. I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago and I jotted down some notes because I knew we were walking into the series and I really felt like the Lord spoke it for this. And I, they shared some things that, kind of actually blew my mind a little bit, but it makes sense when we realize how often we live so far below the standard God has for us. They said this, they were discussing the five C's of the negative internal voice, and I'll tell you what they are in just a minute. But they went on to say this, 70%, hear me church, 70% of our negative thinking goes unperceived. It is embedded in our daily behavior. A negative internal voice is a pattern of negative self-talk that focuses on negativity, harsh judgment, and worst case scenarios. You ever been in the middle of a situation and you knew you had to have a meeting or you had to talk with a family member and you begin to process through all the different ways that meeting can go? How many of you guys know that 99.99999% of the time it goes exactly zero of the ways you processed it out to be? And you spend a lot of time worrying and criticizing and, and thinking about all the things that could happen. And then it went away completely outside of the way you thought it would go. Here's the five C's. You can write them down if you want to. They said this, they go unperceived, 70% of these. Number one is complaining. We, spoke, we focus on the negative aspect. Criticizing. Concern. Concern is excess worry and anxiety about potential outcomes. Comparing, constantly comparing ourselves with one another. By the way, again, they signed us up. 70% of this go, happens and goes unperceived by us. We only pick up on 30% of it. And number five was my favorite one. I'd never heard this word before, but I, I just love it. It's called catastrophizing. The person that always assumes the worst possible outcome to every situation. For every good thing, they got a bad thing that can stand up against it, right? 
And if we're not if we're, if we'll be honest, and they got another cousin because commiserating, that's when it comes along and agrees with the sees and the other people around it. But if we're honest, we all can look at ourselves and say, man, there's a lot of thoughts I've not been taking captive and submitting them to Christ. What it would look like this week if we began to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate in our lives. If we begin to cut down the negative self-talk. First Peter 5 says, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Second Timothy reminds us, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of love, power, and of self-discipline. When life is being shaken, we're prone to fear of losing faith. But it's important that we keep eyes of faith wide open. I believe this with all of my heart, that faith is like a telescope that helps us to see what's unseen by the human eye. I love that, right? So, Because faith helps us go beyond what is just clear to us in our vision. But here's what I found. Our negative internal voice causes us to focus on people, pain, and problems. When we take those things captive, we can focus on our Savior, the anchor of our soul. You see, when you focus on people, you, you don't see them through the eyes of faith. Can I encourage you today? Man, if you'll begin to take captive, God will allow you to see people not as problems, but you begin to see their potential. He'll allow you to see every bit of pain, not as something that you just have to get through and that God doesn't care about you, but that God will sit with you and bring purpose in the midst of the pain. That God has a solution for every problem. One of the things I hate wearing are my glasses. But I wear them because I don't want to fall off the platform when I leave today, right? I want to be able to see. And I have to wear them constantly to correct my nearsightedness. I'll tell you something today. If you want to correct a negative internal voice, it's important to do because negative internal voice is spiritual nearsightedness. It blinds you to the eyes of faith. We have to understand today that that battle is won, not just through the eyes, but also through the ears. Romans 10 says, consequently, faith comes through hearing the message and the message is is heard through the word of Christ. If we don't see it, that's okay. It's time to take out the telescope of faith. To begin to put aside that negative self-talk, to take those thoughts captive, why? So that we don't see what's just natural, we see with supernatural vision. We begin to understand that Emmanuel, God, is with us. His presence is available to us. The writer of Hebrews told us what? That everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So that what? So that those things that cannot be shaken will remain. Shaking shaking will happen in this world. It's going to happen. But remember, your identity is not in what has happened to you, but it's in what is happening in you. You're not alone, and the battle is ultimately over your mind. Would you stand with me today? I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come. Would you just, once you're on your feet, would you close your eyes? I'm gonna pray over you in just a moment. When I'm done praying, we have an incredible altar team that's here. They wanna wage war with you today. There are some of you, maybe you said, you know what, when you talked about that, that negative internal voice, man, I've battled with that for years. We got some prayer warriors up here. I'd love to pray that through with you. Maybe today you got a sickness. You got something going on in your life. We want to pray with you today. We want to stand in faith. Man, God is doing some incredible things. I heard a praise report at the end of worship today. One of our people we've been praying for, they said to, they told me their scans are clear. Amen. I don't know about you, that never gets old. We serve a God that is able. Real quick, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, anyone in the room, I don't want to miss this moment.